Okay, switch out the batteries. Let's get back to the uh, lecture. Let me just refresh really quick so that you know where we are. What we are doing is we're, uh, what I'm doing is I'm attempting to show you how the system is adaptive, how the system of um, a justification based truth maintenance system, um, dependency network, this specific structure allows us, unlike monotonic logic, where new information invalidates the entire system, what ends up happening is new information um, discards all invalid information, but the whole system doesn't collapse. How is it that we do that logically? That's, a that's an extremely difficult question to answer. The only way that I can think about answering without you know, really getting into the formal aspects of it is to show you how it works in a dependency network. Imagine that you are the lead investigator on the ABC murder case, and you initially assume that Abbott is the killer. This assumption is based on the belief that Abbott serves to become, affirmatively, the beneficiary of a large inheritance, and that Abbott does not have an alibi. This justifies your supported belief that Abbott is a suspect. If, however, you recognize at some point later in the investigation that no, Abbott actually has a really good alibi, a really good alibi, well, then you can think conceptually that it's going to trickle back up to the top of my supported belief and change the nature of my supported belief, right? If he has a really, really good alibi, I can no longer, I'm not justified. You can still believe it. You're just an idiot. You can't, you're not justified in believing that Abbott is the murder suspect. Why? Because you thought initially this, that Abbott does not have an alibi but then you recognize that Abbott actually does have an alibi. How do we go about demonstrating this? And this is the, the difficulty that I had, and the way that I came to resolving this was to tell you the story. So, you go out into the field as the detective, the, main, the lead detective on the case, and now we need to add new information, right? So I'll, I'll put, so that you understand, uh, let's do it over here, black, the color black, represents old M A T old information or initial assumption. This is the I, I think this is gonna be like a the clearest way to explain this rather difficult concept. Green, you know green is springtime, right? So green always represents growth, neophyte, new stuff. Green represents new information. New information slash um, new assumptions. So in this image, and blue is my dividing color. <laughs> okay, so. Black represents old information. All of this is old information. This is the this um, justification-based truth maintenance system dependency network is constructed on all my sort of old information, right? I have my primary justification, I have my in-list, my out-list, and my supported belief. That's all the original stuff. Now, new information is gonna be put into the system. The new information is that he actually has an alibi. We know that that has to change our supported belief, the question is, how does that information, how is that information incorporated into uh, the system? So what you have to recognize is, again, this is the system of non-monotonic logic. The, the, the structure of the system has to be able to absorb the, the new information so that we can um, reassess our initial assumptions. So what we're going to be looking at is the bottom half of the, the, um, the structure. Okay, let's say we say... Now, that I just want to start at this point. Let's just say we start at this point. You're going to branch out your node three ways, right? And it's going to be two positives and one negative. So there's a positive. We know that our positive is our endless, our negative is our outless. So it's going to be a positive, a positive, and a negative. This is based on the story, right? Let's say we are attempting to support the belief 
that Abbott actually has a good alibi in the ABC murder story. Let's say we see that he is registered. He's registered at the Albany Hotel, right? So Abbott actually, in the hotel ledger, has his name. This is distinct. This is part of Quine's uh, Quine's example. Um, and I actually do. I actually have the bit. He's registered in the Albany Hotel. Let's just make that assumption, right? So, as the lead investigator, I go. I check the the ledger of the Albany Hotel. Hotel staff signs off. He signs off. There it is. That's a pretty good alibi. Okay, that alibi is going to support the new belief, the new, green represents new, the new belief that Abbott is not the killer. Let's say the Albany Hotel is very far away. If I could write, it's far, A-W-A-Y, right? So this is going to be my end list. This is going to be my end list. The Albany Hotel is very far away, far enough away where Abbott could not have possibly killed the suspect and um, been in the hotel at the same time, right? So he has to, right, this, this waiting, and this is how I want you to see that it is a way of adding waiting in our logic, right? In our logic, in re regular predicate logic, we, we don't have the ability to weight our assumptions. This is a system in which we can weight our assumptions. Obviously, there's two if you want to think of it in this sense, there's a twofold um, support for the justification that he is not the murder suspect. One, because there's a registry. Two, because the hotel's far away. So this adds uh, a sense of waiting. Now, um, statisticians and um, mathematicians have more um, mathematical means of representing weight. But logically, conceptually, this is where the idea of waiting is introduced and it's it, it, hopefully it's very obvious right you have a registration in the ledger it's far away this is going to transform the nature of my assumption now um, the thing that we don't have right on our out list right and our out list is that we don't believe that the register was forged forged right we don't and this is our out list L-I-S-T, We don't believe that the registry was forged. The whole point is, you go back to your captain, you go back to your boss, and you say, hey, you know what? My initial assumption was that Abbott was the suspect in the murder case. But I came to find out, you know, I did some investigation, I went to the Albany Hotel, it's really, really far away, waiting, and I found Abbott's name in the hotel ledger, further waiting, uh, and, and and I don't believe, oh, no, no, I, I, I found his name in the ledger. And then the captain's going to be, the captain's going to say, well, that's not, I mean, clearly it could have been forged, right? How do you know that it's Abbott? Well, I don't believe that it's forged, right? We could expand this even more, right? I don't believe that it's forged. The fact that I don't believe it's forged, the fact that it's far away and it's registered, now leads me to transform this, right? What ends up happening now, and I think this is, this is how you can really make sense of this, is this, our old assumption old information needs to change now. So this out list needs to change to our in list. Right? We change this from out to in, right? as is done here. It's transformed, and then that transformed the nature of our assumption. Our supported belief changes. right? So you can see how new information is adapted into the system. The structure of the system is almost essentially the same. The only things that transformed within the original assumptions were our out list was transformed into an in list and our suspect, the fact that we believe that he was a suspect is no longer in, it's out, meaning that he's not, right? When you see suspect Abbott out, that means Abbott being the suspect is no longer the case. That idea has been thrown out, if you think of it like that, meaning that um, we believe that Abbott is innocent. We initially believed that Abbott was guilty in which is supported by all black. We did more investigation, and then it transformed the nature of our belief. We now believe that Abbott is innocent. How is that proved non-monotonically? It's demonstrated by, oh, and I forgot the last bit, right? Let's just say we, we put premise justifications here. It is the nature of our belief changed when we did further investigation, 
because there was a registry in the hotel ledger. The hotel is far away, and we don't believe the registry was forged. Now, that's where uh, the example stops. I want you to see, however, that we can continue to support this argument in an even longer um, um, justification-based truth maintenance system dependency network if we want to reinforce the registry. So you could understand, I don't have this here, but just conceptually speaking, how would you extend the proof that he was, um, he should not be considered a suspect? Well, you could cross-reference the signature in the ledger with the license. That would add weight to the belief that the registry was not forged. You could look at video surveillance to see him signing it. That would add weight to the fact that it wasn't forged. And then if you wanted an out, you could say that you don't believe that the person in the video is someone other than Abbott. That would add weight. It would be an out list to uh, the belief that the registry wouldn't, wasn't forged. And it can get more and more complex, right? So I think now you recognize how you construct and how you can, in, in critical thinking and everyday practice, incorporate um, a method in which your logic system, unlike um, um, uh, sort of predicate logic and the, the structured, deductive rigor that it has, which serves its own purpose, a non-monotonic logic system allows you to gradually incorporate new information into the original um, uh, dependency network. Think of the green sort of infusing itself into the system, right? This new information infuses itself into the system. This obviously changed the nature of my outlets, which obviously changed my supported belief, right? So uh, this, as I said, the uh, um, justification-based truth maintenance system dependency network is interchangeable with the default logic. So there is a sense in which this can be um, represented within the formal language of non-monotonic logic. And um, I'm not going to write it all down because it's pretty long. It's on page 18 if you want to read it, and it's the following claim. So that this is exactly the same, this default logic representation is exactly the same as our um, as our uh, justification-based truth maintenance system uh, dependency network, right? The dependency network and the default logic representation here is the same. And the question is, how is this read? It's read as follows. If it is provable that X is the beneficiary, X is the beneficiary, and it is consistent um, to assume that X has an alibi, and X is registered in the hotel registry, and X was far away at the time of the murder, and it is not believed, right, that the registry was forged, then conclude that X is not a suspect. You can see how the introduction of new information was easily adapted into our um, dependency network, which gives non-monotonic logic a, a very a great flexibility. And I think it would be really cool to, to see this uh, sort of animated dynamically. So you can see the introduction of new information, and obviously the, our beliefs were changed. My supported belief that he was a suspect is now thrown out the window, and I believe that, no, he's free, he, he's, he's innocent, and here is how that information was incorporated visually in a dependency network, but you can also mathematically represent it in the um, non-monotonic uh, formal language, which, which I've showed you. Last point, and then we'll be done with uh, section 4.1, is just a discussion point, and this is what's important. The system was able, in the example that I just gave over the last um, hour and a half or so, the system was able, this justification-based truth maintenance system, was able to adapt to changing information. Right? Just because Abbott was a beneficiary doesn't mean that he's a suspect. What you can see is that Abbott still is the beneficiary. Right? So you think, well, if he's a beneficiary, that increases the likelihood that he's a suspect. It definitely was um, increased when he didn't have an alibi. The nature of his alibi changed, but he's still a beneficiary, right? So just because the, um, Abbott was a beneficiary doesn't mean that he's guilty. And we demonstrated two things. One, a sense in which he was a beneficiary and he was the suspect. Why was he the suspect? Because he had no alibi. Then using non-monotonic logic and sort of evidence-based reasoning, 
we transform the nature of our supported belief by demonstrating that despite the fact that he's a beneficiary, he also has an alibi. We change our alibi to an enlist and, and thus uh, we transform the nature of our system without collapsing the system itself. So if weight is if weight shift, shifted to the alibi, and I showed you how weight is shifted, which is sufficiently supported, and here is the support, we have to discard the prior assumptions. Discard, discard. We discarded the outlets. We discarded the supported belief, the initial supported belief for a new supported belief. Um, so suspect Abbott in with a rejected, uh, with a rejection based on the new evidence that justifies his innocence. So hopefully uh, that helped. Um, it's as I said, it's not an it's not an easy lecture to give at all because there are no lectures on non-monotonic logic. Um, what I want you to see is that it's accessible, that it's not something that you should be intimidated by. You can, you can gain access to this once you recognize the structure. And then you can complicate this yourself, as I said, with respect to um, adding further weight to his innocence. Um, since we have premise justification in here and premise justification here, what we can do is expand and weight the fact that the registry wasn't forged in a number of ways. And you now know how to do that, hopefully. So you might have to watch this uh, maybe one or two times to fully let it set in. But um, this will uh, conclude the section on non monotonic logic, and I will continue on to other points in the uh, critical thinking series. With that, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.